Happy New, Happy New Year. We are going to finish this year strong tonight in the Word of God uh, and just believe Him for good things to come. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank You. Your truth is amazing, especially as it is revealed to us when understanding comes to our hearts and minds so that we can live that which you have described, that which is your parameters, that which is your guidance and wisdom over our lives. And Father, when we get a hold of that truth and the lights come on, how amazing that is. And I pray that that would happen in this place tonight by the power of your Holy Spirit, the revelation of your truth come to our hearts. And Father, we ask this accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And amen. There's something about this, and uh, we gather here tonight, and I welcome all of you. But sometimes it, this can just feel like a stale classroom. And I, I, I'm, I'm not built for that. I'm not built for stale classroom exchanges. This is life transformative stuff. The things that we study in this room can seem mundane and ordinary and sometimes even have that feel as if, well, I figured you Christians would say that. But when God literally moves in and drives all previous tenants out and takes sole ownership of your life, Whoever comes knocking, he answers the door. Who are you here for? Uh, uh, <laughs> and they go scampering away. And the reality of allowing him to be Lord is a big deal. Because when he is Lord of your life, he gets to say all that happens in your life. And part and parcel, we break this thing down for you week after week to say, this is just one more part. This is just one more piece of who he is and what he wants for your life. And when you're ready to make him Lord and allow him to move in, these are not teachings. These now become reflections of, oh yeah, that's who I am. I'm a forgiver. I'm a forgiver. Now, part of what I want to tell you tonight is being a Christ follower and being a forgiver has these other parts tied to it that a lot of people don't like. And it's called honesty and forthrightness. Amen. That sometimes people are offended by Christians because we just say how it is. We just let it out and say, look, like, I don't know what planet you're on, but this is how it is. And they may argue with you, and you just don't even hear the argument. You just keep standing on the firmness of truth. And whatever they say back to you, you say, well, that's nice and all, but here's the truth. And our action is not to be offensive. We're, we're not trying to be offensive, but on the other side... Someone that is not redeemed, someone that is not saved, can take your openness and your forthrightness and your honesty and be offended by it, can be mad at you, can slam the door in your face, say, I'm not going to be your friend anymore, I'm not going to associate with you anymore, and someone that you love dearly will part ways from you. And we talk about that in the scriptures. Jesus says, you will be persecuted for my name's sake when you walk the planet. And very few people understand what that means. They're thinking, you know, possibly living in a foreign country, being excommunicated by an entire village, being uh, asked by your family to not only move out of the house, but to move out of the country. You're an embarrassment. And a lot of people think that's persecution. But really... If social media did anything, it revealed the bullying side of people and the receptors of people that get bullied and how that makes them feel from young to old. We've watched suicides increase because of social media when people don't feel accepted for their views or their beliefs and they're picked on and they're bullied and they're rejected 
and then all of a sudden they feel alienated, persecuted, and downright don't feel like living anymore. And I just want to say to you that when we walk this narrow road with Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Narrow is the way. Straight is the gate. Few be them there that find it. He's not joking around. We try to bring our baggage into a narrow path with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, you can come. The baggage has got to go. And so we want to talk about the baggage that people strap to us. The stuff that they say, you've got to carry this for the rest of your life. You've got to carry this anger. You've got to carry this disappointment. You've got to carry this rage. And the Lord Jesus is standing there saying, um, I've got a dumpster over here for you. You need to get rid of that baggage. You need to let it go. And in fact, I'm going to incinerate it so you can't pick it back up and take it with you. Uh, we're not going to put it in a, a, an ash heap in your pocket and take it with you. Nothing. It's not coming with you. And these are sometimes hard things to receive from the Lord. Because when he's saying them to us, some of us have only known hurt our, own, our, our whole lives, and that's all we've got. And we hang on to memories, and we hang on to pain, and we hang on to sorrow, and we hang on to grief. And when someone tells you that stuff's got to be go gone, you feel empty. But the Lord says, I will provide a comforter for you. I will provide the spirit of the living God, that which animated dirt that God created in the garden, Adam and Eve, that which he created and breathed his breath and made dirt become a human being, he will do for you. Breathe his breath into you that you are a new creation. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are brand new. Amen? Amen. So here we are under the umbrella of reconciliation. There are some people in our lives that we need to, to somehow tell them that they are forgiven or we need to sit down and have a conversation with someone and ask for forgiveness. We've done some things to hurt people and people have hurt us and we are at a a standstill with some individuals. And most people, because of the sin nature, just walk away and never think of reconciling, never think of fixing it. And what they don't realize is when you don't fix it, you take a piece of your brokenness with you. And the Lord says, I want to do some great things in your life, but how about we go and at least, you don't have to live with this person, you don't even have to be, you know, best buds with them anymore, but let's at least do the forgiveness part so they can see the seed of Christ inside of you. Knowing that you would never do this under your own power, never do this under your own ability, but under the, the direction and the power of the Holy Spirit, you make something possible that seemed impossible in your mind and in their mind. With it is going to come... Again, openness, frankness, and even an in-your-face confrontation. And sometimes we've got to go there. Sometimes we've got to be the vocal one. We've got to step up and say something under the umbrella of reconciliation because the other person sure ain't making a move to make it any better. And so you've got to be the one that makes the initial, all right, I'm going to fix it if they aren't. If everybody's going to drag their feet, and we call it, you know, the, the elephant in the room, everybody knows what's going on, everybody knows it's bugging them, and it's bugging you and bugging everybody else, but nobody wants to talk about it. And somehow, the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wants us to give us boldness, to declare and open the door for some conversations that are going to bring healing into our lives and other people 
that we may or may not even like, but guess what? God loves everybody. He loves people we don't even like. Get that through our head. He loves, adores, treasures people, and we're like, God, are you sure? I mean, look at their resume. And he says, but let's look at your resume first. And you're like, oh, yeah. Like, oh, you can love him. You can love her. If you can love me, you can. And then we start to have our eyes open to the reality that maybe Christ needs to shine through us in some very bold, declarative ways. So we're coming in for our initial descent. We've been in this chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chapters on reconciliation. We must be really bad at this. <laughs> to have instruction, seven chapters worth. I mean, humans must be very poor at this skill of reconciliation. And so we're coming in for our initial descent. That is, we're leaving the 30,000 feet and we're, we're dropping down a little bit. We're, we're starting to be able to see the city lights. We're starting to be able to see off in the distance. I think that's the runway. I think we're going to land soon. And as we do, we pick up the Apostle Paul needing to bring some real clarity to the big issue that hinders genuine reconciliation. And that is openness and honesty. In order to open someone else's eyes, I don't know, have you ever, have you ever played I spy with someone? See, I'm not good at it. Like I would say, I spy something yellow. And like stare, like right at it. <laughs> but some people won't even pick up my visual cues. And they're like, I, yellow, I, I, the strands on the flag. No, I'm, I'm looking right at it. <laughs> Some things are so obvious, but we don't realize the blinders that people have built for themselves, for protection, for whatever reason. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen an abused animal and you go to pet them and they just they just back away and you're like oh dear god like i don't want to hurt you but there's a a knee-jerk reaction that people have and and sometimes we've we've got to open people's eyes so they can be healed and we can be healed and we can move on to actual blessings from god are we making sense in the house tonight? So I'm going to pick it up in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 11. And sometimes, if I could give it a title tonight, sometimes you just have to say it out loud. You've been thinking it and rehearsing it for years. You've had that person in front of you in your mind. You've rehearsed the speech, and God says, come on, say it. Just You've rehearsed it. You've got it. Now just say it out loud. I'd give that this, this title. He says, Oh, Corinthians! Exclamation point. I, I think for all of these six chapters up to here, Paul has somewhat bottled up this energy. I, I was listening to a devotional program this morning about the Apostle Paul, and although we have his letters, he didn't write any of them, he spoke them to a dictator, or a, a dictation a person, a scribe. So when we have the letters of Paul, we have his emotions, we have him talking out loud, and can you imagine the, the scribe sitting there, all right, Paul, what do you got next? Oh, Corinthians! Like, you can see him pacing the floor. Oh, I've been, I've been holding this back. And I've got something to tell you. And here's what he says. We have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. And a bunch of people just say, no thanks, and turn off right there. The Apostle Paul is laying down the framework for what it means to be a child of God. 
at the, at the risk of someone damaging your heart, you open it wide. That's risky behavior, isn't it? He says, I have built a relationship with you. I have not held back anything from you. My heart is wide open. The thing about a wide open heart is anything can come out of their mouth. Have you ever met these people? You think to yourself, I wish I had their courage. I'm like they think it and they just say it. There's just something about their character that they are, their heart's wide open because the Bible says out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And there are some people that just, here it comes, <laughs> like it or not. So I would say to them, get that thing redeemed. Get that heart checked. Get it right with the Lord so that what comes out of you is indeed helpful. <laughs> But let's make no mistake that Paul was about to say some things that could be perceived as offensive. I mean, we, we can look at these things and take Paul as a uh, preacher. We can take Paul as a theologian, which he is. We can take him as a missionary, which he is. We can take him as a teacher, which he is. Or we can just take him for a regular guy that sometimes gets fed up with people and all the craziness that's going on around. And he says, now listen, you Corinthians are driving me up a wall. My heart is wide open, which is a dangerous thing to say. Because he's about to let the flood waters come out of his open heart. Are you with me? So he says, you are not restricted by us. But you are restricted by your own affections. In other words, how, how can I say it? Let, let, let's... Let's paint the picture of a, an aged man who's stuck raising his, his grandkids, all right? I'm just trying to make the story up as I go. Right. An aged, yeah. An aged man that's stuck and everything's falling apart. And he sticks his finger in the little kid's face and says, this is all your fault. And the little kid's like, I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> Let alone, how is this my fault? Right? And that, that's just a scenario that I painted. But I deal with adults in a jail who kind of are under the weight of people have told them that their whole life. And they think literally everything is their fault and they think they're failures and they think they've got no worth whatsoever because someone has told them their whole life that they're, they have no value and everything is their fault, right? So it's not too far-fetched of a story, right? Well, evidently, we're watching Paul somehow be the receptor of a letter that has come from them saying, Paul, if there's any problems in this church, it's all your fault. And Paul's like, let me tell you something. All right, let me, let's roll up the sleeves here. Let me, t let me tell you something. All right? I have not, my ministry, my partners that have come into this church, we have not restricted you at all. We have not been the source of the problem. I'll tell you what the source of your problem is. Don't you love when someone leads with that? I'll tell you what your issue is. I mean, I believe Paul's fired up. And I take it from that first line with an exclamation point. Oh, oh, Corinthians. I'll tell you what the problem is. Your own affections are what restrict you from the fullness of God coming down into our church and allowing the power of God to heal, deliver, and set free. It's what you love more than God. Ooh. See, so let's, let's get into a marriage that they're just, I mean, they're bickering, they're fighting. And she says to him, you know, this is all your fault. 
And, and he says, oh, you're just like your mother. This is your fault. It, it, gets, it gets bitter. It gets nasty. It, it's, it's just full of disgruntled. And really the issue is that they've stopped looking at each other in a sense of love one for another and they're starting to find fault and they start to love either themselves more than the one they married. Or they start to love the world, they start to love their job, they start to love their coworkers, they start to love their addiction, they start to love something more than the relationship and then there's anger and vitriol and all this stuff and they start blaming each other. And that's what we got here. A relationship that is frazzled and fried. And finally, someone just says, you know what the problem is? It's not me, and really, it's not you. It, it's the affections of your heart that have robbed you from the fullness of God's blessings. You love something yourself, some matter, some popularity, some form of godliness but denies the power thereof, and you've got a handle on that, but you've lost the love of God. That's hard to say to people, but a lot of times it's the truth. That sometimes we, we can blame and push buttons and really get fired up, and some people are just really good at fighting. And you, you, you step into the arena of, of their household, and you're like, um, I think you guys just like to fight. I don't think the issue is the issue at all. I think you've lost your first love. Yep. And when you begin to lose your first love, it's not like the devil just stands there and says, I wonder what we should do here. As soon as you take your focus off the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the devil is right there to serve up something else. Right. A substitute. A... Uh, how shall I say, an imitation. Paul says it this way, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, why does he use those two comparisons? Because alcohol is a direct imitation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I just said a mouthful. Drunkenness or alcohol is a direct imitation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Often people in church, that's good, Bob. Often people in church who are filled with the Holy Spirit are often viewed by the general church population as somewhat weird and a little bit off because they do certain things. They will impromptu sing songs and they'll sing loud and they don't care who's listening or if they have the ability to sing. And you think nothing of it in the, in the bar, however. You get a person locked up or uh, drunk up on enough Jack Daniels, they'll stand on a, a platform with a microphone and sing karaoke to the wild cheers of other people who are in the same circumstance, I guess is the... Um, someone that comes to church or filled with the Holy Spirit and they just can't wait to give in the offering. They're, they're, they're givers. They want to build a new church. They want to spend for missionaries. They just they don't want to give, give, give. And you think, well, you're giving a lot of money to that church. What's wrong with you? You move it into the bar and somebody gets drunk enough, they want to buy drinks for everybody. Yeah. Right? And nobody thinks they're weird. They're like, ooh, you're a hero. It's all in the house. You see? Um, there are people in church that they don't just sway to the music. They actually dance in church. And we think, oh, God, I'm not sitting next to them. I may get an elbow to the forehead. I might get a knee to the back. I, what might happen around them? I'm not quite sure. Move over to the bar, give someone enough to drink, and they think they're 
Fred Astaire on the dance floor. <laughs> and nobody says, nobody says a word. See, we've normalized it in the world, and Satan loves it, that it's been normalized in the world. But you get filled with the Spirit of God in church, and you're, oh, God, you're weird. And yet they're the exact same actions that come out of a person. It's just one is imitated, and by morning, it's gone. But when the Spirit of God fills you, he never leaves. Amen. He never leaves. And so the same enthusiasm that led you in the building leads you out of the building, leads you home, leads you to the shopping center, leads you to work, and people are like, what are you on? <laughs> I'm on the wellspring of life. I walk in the healing power of Almighty God. I got off on a tangent, I'm sorry. Preacher's jag, we call it. So Paul um, says you're restricted, but not by me. I have no, I've done nothing but teach you the gospel. I've done nothing but model for you the truth. I've done nothing but model for you godliness. How can you say that I've restricted you in any way? If you have any restrictions or lack of blessings in your life, it's because you love something more than God. It's your own affections. Verse 13. Now in return for the same. In other words, you've spoken to me this way, but I, I've got something to say to you. And it says parenthetically, and he's saying to the guy that's writing it, he's saying to his scribe, uh, tell him I'm going to talk to them like children. And I don't know if the scribe was supposed to put it in there, but he did. He put it in parentheses. I speak to you as children. Now, we're all adults in this room. What, what if I walked in here and I said, now, now kids, settle down. The old man has something to say now. See, you begin to feel like I have some sort of uh, superior complex. Like, I, I'm better than you. But if it walks like a child, talks like a child, and acts like a child, sometimes you have to treat it like a child. So we, you know, we don't like that terminology in America. So you know what we did? We reframed it with this word. You're immature. All right, I can, I can stomach that. How about you? I'm immature. I've got some areas of my life I need to grow. I mean, we can deal with that. Call me a child. Now, wait a minute. I, I can shave and all. I'm not a child. We get offended somebody calls us a child. But immaturity and childlike behavior are the same thing. And so he says, you know what? I've got to talk to them like children. And because I have a couple of them, and I've raised some, there's just, there's, there's just some times where you gotta, you got to get down there where they are. I'm going to pick on Johnny. And I got to grab him by his little cheeks. I say, Johnny, look at me. L look at me, man. You, you got to look at me. And I'll have his face. I'll have his nose to mine. I'll have his whole features right here. And you know where his eyes are? Like... <laughs> Look at me, boy. I need your eyes. I really don't need your nose. I need your eyes. I need your eyes. I need to look into you, and I need to say something to you. You know what Paul does? He does the same thing. Eyeball to eyeball, nose to nose, chin to chin. He says, be open. Be open to this. Because people, when they hear that they have to forgive, they may sit and pleasantly smile, but on the inside, they've already shut down. And he says, now, now listen to me on this. You've got to be open to what I'm telling you. And that is called the proverbial ball is in your court. I can be filled with knowledge. Any teacher, any preacher can stand up here and and deliver. I mean, just give you all the truth. But if you're not open to receive it, 
Uh, I'll give you a for example. Uh, Wednesday, I go to a chiropractor. I have a weekly chiropractor appointment. And I, I got in my car. I, I, well, back it up. I'm dressed, and then I get in my car, and I go there. But they are closed. Holiday hours. Now, I went there. I did all the things that I'm supposed to do. But if the door won't open, you can't get in. I mean, this is rocket science, isn't it? This is just so, wow, pastor, that's your example? But that, I can get dressed, I can turn the camera on, I can open the scriptures to you, but if you're not open, I can jiggle that door all night. But if you're not open to receive it, what are we doing? We would call it playing church. Check me off on the attendance list. A few weeks here, I'm going to fill out what's called an ACMR. Annual Church Ministry Report. We count dollars. We count heads. We count classes. We count activities. We count missionaries that walk through. We count everything in the assemblies. They want to know all those stats. And we can brag all this stuff, all these things happened at Calvary. But if nobody's open, then it's just numbers. Right? It's just numbers. So Paul says, all right, Corinthians, you, you, you've said some things to me and they hurt me pretty bad. But you know what? My heart's wide open right now. And I need you to be open to receive something from me. And so he's going to give it to him. Here it goes. Verse number 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, you see what he's doing here. He says, I, I'm trying to have a relationship with you, the church. I'm trying to build you in the most holy faith. Now, if I'm working around the clock to study the word of God, to deliver it to you on a weekly basis, Wednesday and Sunday and Wednesday and Sunday, and I'm working my heart out, I'm praying, I'm seeking for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Father, fill me with your spirit so I can declare these unsearchable truths by our flesh. But if your spirit reveals them, God, we will have something to say in the pulpit. And you work really hard. And you think, I, let, let's pick on Christy tonight. Let's, let's say, all right, I see Christy. She's come in the door. Oh, she's ready to receive. And she only hangs out with me for, I don't know, let's say an estimate of two to three hours a week. But you hang out with this punk over here that's trying to lead you back to alcohol and drugs, and you spend 90% of your time with him, and I'm trying to lead you to the truth, who wins that battle? The jerk wins. The jerk wins because you're not as invested as I am. So Paul says, you know what the problem is here? You, you've got one hand hanging on to Jesus and you've got your other hand over here with your friends of, that are unbelievers and you're trying to have a move of God. And God says, I'm letting go. You can go hang out with them if you want to. You can live that lifestyle. I, I, I bought you from that. I redeemed you from all that. You can go back there if you want to, but you're not dragging me there. And he's saying, you know, let's, let's deal with the real issue. You're hanging out with unbelievers. In fact, he would go on to say uh, here, you're yoked to them. Which we're talking contractually. Like that is marriages that are built on the wrong foundation. One person is radically saved and the other is completely lost. And they say, yeah, but he's cute. Maybe if I read him the Bible, he'll come to church. He doesn't want to have anything to do with God. 
He doesn't want to have anything to do with church. In fact, when you bring up church, it just takes him to a fevered pitch of rage. And Paul says, that's your issue, and you're blaming me? You're blaming me when you're yoked to these people who are wicked through and through? And so he's got them by their face. He says, now listen to me. Listen to me on this. You're yoked together with unbelievers. And it's a weird reference. It's an agricultural reference. It goes all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 22. You want to look at it with me? Let's turn there. Oh, it's 712. I've got like hours. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 22. It seems like such an odd verse. I wish I was reading the King James. It's a lot more fun. But it says here, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. So um, to plow a field in those days, we're not looking at a John Deere tractor, are we? We're looking at farm animals that, are, that have a wooden square around each of the necks of the animals and then a long pole coming off of the animal that is hitched to a metal plow device that when the two animals start to go, they will pull the plow device and rip up the soil. Are you all with me? So if the animals, if we put an ox next to a donkey, the sheer size difference is the first thing that we see. Oxen are usually muscle-bound, freakishly large, strong animals. And then there's a donkey, who looks like the hated stepchild of the horse and mule marriage <laughs> that just, like, what, what, what is this? What is this thing? Well, the King James says it's an ass, you see. <laughs> and I'd like to, to stand on that tonight. Mm -hmm. That you shouldn't yoke yourself to an ass. <laughs> I digress. Now, two farm animals that you want to go at the same speed and the same strength, and that ox is not waiting for the mule. The ox is built to work the fields. I would suggest to you the picture that is shown to us in Deuteronomy is absolutely ludicrous. That donkey will just get dragged along for the plow. That, that's exactly what would happen in this picture. Now you miss that if you're reading your Bible for just, I'm reading my Bible. Evidently God doesn't want donkeys and oxes together. No. No, he, he's trying to paint a picture here. And he says, picture the comedy of it. An oxen and a donkey, that oxen's going to take off and the donkey's just going <laughs> to get dragged through the field and you're going to think, why did I even put the donkey in there to begin with? And so Paul reaches back to Old Testament, he drags it into the New Testament and says, don't be yoked together with an ass. Because they will slow you down. You'll be dragging them every, come on, it's time to go to church. Drag them along. We're going out to evangelize. What? Yeah, we are, get in the car. Going to Bible study. We're going to church again. Yep, get in the car. And you're dragging them. And they're not doing anything to help. Don't yoke yourself together with unbelievers. They're just going to, they're going to be dead weight. And I, our compassion says, but I love them. But I love them. And Paul says, oh, that's cute. That, that, that's cute. 
But the problem is you're blaming your lack of blessing on the preacher when it's, it's your dead weight, you see. It's, can you, can you cut the dead weight and let's go? Are you with me? Is that too much on a Wednesday night? Do we need to get, you know, have an altar call and the preacher get saved? He said, ask ten times. <laughs> Eleven. What's wrong with that guy? Going in circles. Dragging dead weight. 2 Corinthians 6. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Look, a law-abiding person cannot live with a lawbreaker. Just think of doing your taxes with that person. You want to do it by the book. You want to do it all according to the righteousness of God, knowing God is in the room. He never leaves me. He doesn't forsake me. We're going to do everything right. And a lawbreaker who you're in a relationship with says, well, if we, you know, I got some other kids over here. If we claim them, we can get those taxes. Oh, yeah, see, this happens. Like you've been in these conversations, right? Start claiming kids that aren't yours. IRS will never find out. Start cheating the system. And the, and the Apostle Paul said, you want to you wanna blame me for your depraved lifestyle and your fallout when you're trying to live life with a lawbreaker and you're a law-abiding, God-fearing person and you want to blame me? The problem is, is your affections are out of whack here. You, you can't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. You cannot have law-abiding person with a, a lawbreaker. It just doesn't work. Let, let's get into the ugly under, underbelly of, of a jail where officers try to have relations with an inmate, which, by the way, is against the law, right? <laughs> as soon as an officer bridges that gap to break the law. He who once upheld the law is now underneath it and held in the same jail, right? And it happens because you cannot have law abiding and unlaw abiding together. You will always go to the lowest common denominator. It always breaks that way. And Paul says, you're, you're blaming the lack of blessing in your church on the pastor. Look at your own life for a little bit. That, that's, that's hard to do sometimes. When, when you, you know what's going on and you're pointing it and saying, I spy something yellow. <laughs> it's right here. And we do the proverbial ostrich head in the sand and say, I, I don't see a yellow shirt. I just don't see it. Look, if that's not enough, I mean, these examples, he's just firing away. He says, um, what communion has light with darkness? The very nature of turning a light on is that it drives darkness away, Right? So the word fellowship is actually, uh, in this passage, in the, the original language, Greek, was intimate fellowship. You cannot have intimate fellowship with light and darkness. They will not. Darkness is always trying to canopy light, and light is always pushing back darkness. That's the nature of both of them. But he's cute. <laughs> so? <laughs> is he light? But she has a, a good job. <laughs> she makes lots of money. Is she righteous? Is she a Proverbs 31 woman? Do you understand where Paul's at? 
We can play the blame game all day long. Let's uh, cut to the chase. I've been doing this for a long time, and God has chastised me personally over and over for my personal life, and now you want to blame me for your lack of blessing. Let's get it straight here. I'm going to open my mouth, and you need to be open to hear it. Some of you are fellowshipping with darkness in your light, and you're thinking it's going to work, and it never will. And then he goes on to say, um, and what accord has Christ with Belial? I love this one. Accord is a word that, um, you know, we, we, we hear it in the news once in a while. There's a peace accord. It's about the only time we really use that language. Is, um, there's an accord between these two nations that they're going to have peace with one another. That's, that's the language that we hear. But it's just a fancy word for an agreement, right? We have an agreement. So what he's saying, does Jesus have an agreement with Belial? Well, who's Belial? Well, it's just another name for Satan, right? It's capitalized in this passage. Does Jesus have an agreement with Satan? Like, have they shook hands in a dark room and said, well, devil, if you give me two-thirds of the world, I'll let you have a third. Like, is he making shady deals with the devil? Like, Paul's being absolutely ludicrous with his statement. I mean, why? Why? Would we even think that Christ would make a deal with the devil and yet you invite Jesus into your heart and you want to make deals with the devil? This word Belial means wicked and worthless. I'm trying not to be judgmental. I really, I really am. But... I think the proper word would be discernment. And I'm not trying to pick on any group of people. But when God gives you discernment, you can walk into a room and know who the worthless, wicked people are. They just, Amen. they give off yes. stuff. And it's as though it's a big hula hoop around them that it's bumping into you before you even get close. Oh, but they've got game. They've got skill. They've got some way to, to coax you away from the illusion that it's wicked and worthless. And he's saying, don't fall for that because Christ would never make a deal with the devil. So don't you dare do the same thing. And remember, he's got their, their face cupped in his hand. Now, be open to this, guys. He's not trying to blame them. He's saying, be open to the possibility that it's not the preacher that's causing you grief. It's some other people in your life that are causing you some problems. I'm going to show you how to deal with them. I'm going to be bold with you and tell you how it is. And guess what you need to do with them? Be bold and tell them how it really is. That's hard to do unless we have an example. And finally, Paul says, I'm just, I'm so tired of being nice and civil and quiet. Oh, Corinthians, do I have a mouthful for you tonight? And then he says, on, on what part has a believer with an unbeliever? I, I love the language of that one. I mean, he could have chosen any phraseology, but what does it mean to be a believer? You follow the Apostle Paul into a jail. He's been arrested for preaching the gospel. He's hanging out in the jail and he's sharing his faith and teaching songs to the other inmates. They are so enamored with Paul's message and his song that they just start singing louder and louder and louder that a supernatural thing happens. The jail begins to shake. All of their handcuffs and chains on their ankles break off. The jailer sees that the jail doors have flung open and all he can think is the inmates have run and I'm a dead man. Because you lose your inmates, you're, you're fired. You're dead. You don't have a job, you don't have a life anymore. 
He runs into the jail and finds that no one has left. And he says, this, this is peculiar. And they're still singing praises and glory to God. And the Apostle Paul says, what's the problem here? You look suicidal. He's like, I, I thought for sure you all ran and I was a dead man. There's something different about you guys. What is it? And Paul preaches the gospel to him. And he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Thus the word believer. That's just the way Paul means it. Going from suicidal to thinking your job means everything to there's something bigger than my job. There's something bigger than my family. There's something bigger than my career. It's the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I believe, I see the proof right in front of me. Most of the other inmates would have already ditched out of here, but you guys remain to reach out and save a lost and weary soul. Now, what kind of person, after going through that, would want to hang out with someone who does not believe? There's no commonality there. Once you've been transformed, once your eyes have been opened to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you can describe yellow all day to them and they can't see it. What are you talking about? Until the Lord draws them, it's just the blinders are on. But you want for them so badly to come with you and some people just won't. I know this story just sounds ludicrous, but I had a girlfriend when I was 12. I, I don't know what, you don't go anywhere. <laughs> you might sit at lunch together. Like, I don't know what kind of dating relationship you have at 12. But anyway, at 12 years old, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit on a Sunday night at my church. I mean, I, I felt power unleashed from God inside of me. I spoke in tongues. I, I fell on the floor like power hit me. I went home and I thought she would love it. I called her. Hey, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit tonight. What the? And hung up. I thought, well, there goes that love relationship. <laughs> It's all gone now. It's all over. But the reality of that is some people just, they can't go with you. They just don't believe. They think you're weird. They think you're a nutcase. But what you've been is delivered. Yeah. Set free from all the bondage. And you tell people and they're like, what are you talking about? We're going to the bar tonight. What are you even talking about? Um, I don't go there anymore. I'm free. You see, there's no commonality between the two worlds. One believes and one says you're nuts. They don't believe. And Paul's bringing every example in. Examine your life. Examine your life. Quit blaming the preacher. Quit blaming the worship team. Quit blaming the environment. Quit blaming the church. And look inside. Look at your relationship. See what's going on. And so he says, uh, verse 16, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? I mean, what would, what would you do if you walked in here and I actually was going to lead a service and we were going to bow down to an image that Bob carved out for us? <laughs> Bob says, hey, I had a dream the other night that, that we're supposed to bow down to this carved image. So I carved it out for us, and we're supposed to bow down, and he gives me the speech, and I say it to everybody. I mean, you should, you should have me thrown out, right? You should not walk into a temple and see idols. What does the temple of God have with, with idols? Nothing, right? There, there, there should not be any idols in the church. And so he says, for you are the temple of the living God. Which means... That if you walk in this building, you should never see an idol. If we walk around in your heart, 
honey, I shrunk the kids, and went inside your heart, and walked around. I should not find any idols in your mind or in your heart, any affections or any affinities for things that are not of God. And he says, going all the way back, that's what your restriction is. You belong to God. You've been purchased with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You're his, and you've got some idols in your heart. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God does not want you to do this journey by yourself. He says, I'll walk with you. I'll talk with you. I'll go on this journey with you. Can you imagine every room you walk into, knowledgeable, God is with me. I have nothing to be afraid of. There's no reason to fear. God is with me. He promised he'll never leave me. He will not forsake me. Supernatural creator God is in the room tonight and says there's no reason to fear anything. There's nothing bigger than who he is and what he can do for you. And he wants to dwell with you every single day. So he has some instructions for them. Remember, his, his hand is cupped around their cheeks. Look at me. Be open to this. Come out from among them and be separate. That's a tall order. Because there's been bickering and arguing. And he says, you know what the real resolution needs to be? You need to come out from the wickedness that you've been hanging out with all the time and be separate. See, growing up at my house, there were plates that only came out on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Why can't we use those? They're only good enough for our aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas and cousins. Like why? They were set apart for special use, right? And if you can see yourself in all of the utensils of the world, you are chosen by God for his special use. And he doesn't want you to be dirtied with the common of this life. Set apart, ready, clean vessels to be used by Almighty God. We can bicker and blame each other all day long, or we can reconcile and acknowledge that the real problem is the people in our lives that are dragging us down that we are letting in and having affections and affinities for things and things that are not good for us and people that are acidic for our relationship. He says, let's acknowledge that and come out and be separate. That action alone will, will make people feel like, oh, you're too good for us. But that's when you just open your mouth and it says, this has nothing to do with you and has everything to do with my healing. I must do this according to the will of God, my healer. Are you, are you understanding me tonight? Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I mean, what a speech from Paul. He's frustrated and then he lets it all out, but he can end it like this. That if we want some real resolution, we both have to take some inventory and see where our affections lie and separate ourselves from things that are damaging us internally and then give it all to the Lord and say, will you be our God and walk among us? What a church we would be if people walked in and said, God is in this place. It's not regular church here at Calvary. God is in the place. He's not restricted. We restrict ourselves from his presence. So I encourage you to take some inventory and come Sunday as we launch into the new year, the right stuff right now. And Pastor Matt's going to open the first week with the right worship. The right heart of worship. 
Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I so thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Your word speaks to us. Your word transforms us. And I pray tonight that indeed these words will transform our hearts to become the men and women, the sons and daughters that you intend for us to be. And I ask this accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen.